Chapter 6 One night while my mom was on her first trip back to Germany, my dad came home late, smelling of booze. He started talking to me. We all sometimes do things we shouldn't do, he said. Oh, God. But that's okay, right? I'm your kid. Are you looking for absolution from me? Me? You want me to rid you of guilt for something you just did? I knew by this stage that I couldn't turn to my parents for help or support or approval, but I didn't expect them to dump their own problems on me. Suddenly, I remembered an incident that had happened a few years before. My dad had answered the phone one evening and was clearly disturbed by what he heard. He spoke quietly to my mom, and then they called the police. When the cops arrived, they asked my dad to recount what he had heard on the phone, and he told them that the man on the other end of the line had told him if my dad didn't stop seeing some woman, he would hurt my dad. He said he'd cut his balls off, piped my mother. We all just treated it as a case of mistaken identity, but now I wondered. Home felt like an even more dangerous place after that. It would be decades before I finally found out what was going on, but I knew right there and then that our house had become a potentially deadly whirlpool. I'm drowning. It was bad enough picturing myself barreling down the road in a car with no steering wheel or alone on a floating dock far from shore surrounded by darkness. Now it felt as if the floating dock was sinking. Whatever was going on with my sister was being exacerbated by my parents. Whatever was going on with me was being exacerbated by my parents. My home felt as fraught with danger as school and other social situations. I could not escape a pervasive sense of fear. I was only 15 years old and I was losing it, and I had nobody to talk to. Nobody. Totally alone. Petrified. What should I do? I could sense that it was going to end very badly if things went on like this. Am I going to take my own life? Am I going to go nuts like my sister? Julia had reacted to her profound issues by choosing a path that led to self-destruction and numbing herself. Obviously, that was a road to ruin. How I dealt with things was up to me. Sure, I was on my own, but I had choices. If I did nothing, that too was a choice, and I knew the consequences would be dire. I refused to be a victim. I wanted to fix myself. I wanted to roll up my sleeves and get my shit together. I wanted to make things work, to transform my world into one I like. But how? I was riding my bike when it hit me. As I turned the corner near our house, a thought hit me like a sledgehammer. I need to get help. Otherwise, I suddenly realized I wasn't going to make it. Otherwise, I was going to make bad choices, or no choice. I would just keep spiraling downward. Do something. Then one night, I overheard a friend of my sister's talking about an outpatient psychiatric clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. Here was something concrete, a place you could go. It had a name and an address. I looked the hospital up in the phone book. I waited until nobody was home one day and called the psychiatric clinic. I made an appointment. On the day of the appointment, I took two subways and a bus to get there. I walked in alone and said, I need help. They had me sign in. Fortunately, I didn't need parental authorization, and it cost only $3. Someone took me back to meet a doctor wearing a white lab coat over his clothes. I didn't know anything about therapy. I just hoped someone would tell me how to live. I was surprised when all I got during our first conversation was questions, not answers. Everything was turned around. I wanted the doctor to tell me what to do, and instead he basically turned my questions back on me. It would be quite a while before I realized this was the basis of therapy. It wasn't about someone leading you through life by the hand. This doctor, a complete stranger, kind of furrowed his brow and looked away when I talked. Is he looking at me like I'm crazy? After that first session, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Still, I decided to try it again. Whatever it took. Roll up your sleeves. The next time I went, though, I asked to see a different doctor. Thankfully, they obliged. The second doctor was named Jesse Hilson. I didn't feel self-conscious around Dr. Hilson. He didn't look at me like I was nuts. He quickly made me realize that even though I thought the rest of the world was normal and that I was the outlier, that wasn't true. Plenty of other people had issues that plagued them, too. I wasn't alone. 
I wasn't the one person in a million who felt his world caving in, felt himself imploding. Thank God. This was progress. I was still yearning for some support and reassurance at home, and I told my dad that I had started seeing a psychiatrist. He was dismissive. You just want to be different, he scowled. Then he got angry. You think you're the only one with problems, he shouted. No, I knew I wasn't. My sister had problems, and I suspected my dad did too. Though who knew what he was talking about that night when he wanted my forgiveness. But I wasn't going to succumb to my problems or surrender in the face of them. I was going to try to tackle them. I was going to fight. I started meeting with Dr. Hilson every Wednesday after school. I would stop at a deli near the hospital, buy a turkey sandwich with Russian dressing, sit on a bench in Central Park and eat it, and then go see Dr. Hilson. Each afternoon when I left, I was already looking forward to the next week. Talking with Dr. Hilson represented a rope I could hold on to. Finally, I was doing something, taking charge of my destiny and improving myself. I was rising to the challenge. Chapter 7 In early 1968, not long after I turned 16, Scott Muni's English Power Hour broadcast a new hit on the British charts called Fire Brigade by The Move. It was about a girl who was so hot that you need to call 911, run and get the fire brigade. Now I was a dyed-in-the-wool Anglophile and The Move was one of my favorite groups. And what I was doing at that point in terms of songwriting was taking inspiration from songs I remembered from the radio. When I heard Fire Brigade, I loved the concept. So I sat down and began to hash out a song of my own using the same idea. I hadn't heard the song enough to actually copy it musically, but I had grasped something that I really liked, and my chorus went like this, Get the firehouse, cause she sets my soul afire. I called the song Firehouse. This was real progress. With every new song I wrote, my sense of purpose grew stronger. I may not have had a social life, but I had music and a dream. So many people are miserable, they need someone to entertain them. Why can't it be me? One day at high school, a teacher pulled me aside. Why aren't you showing up for class? Why aren't you applying yourself, he asked me. Because I'm going to be a rock star, I said. As the guy looked at me, his face betrayed his thoughts. You poor fool. Then he forced a half smile and said, A lot of people want to be rock stars. Yeah, I told him, but I will be one. Outside of my band, the post-war baby boom, I didn't have anything else in my life, just my guitar, my stereo, and more and more often, concerts. I envied the kids who had social circles and weekend get-togethers, but I didn't have any of that. I had not figured out how to be part of things, so I often went to shows by myself. It was something fulfilling. In 1968, I saw Jimi Hendrix live in a small auditorium at Hunter College on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I saw The Who, The Yardbirds, and Traffic. I saw Otis Redding and Solomon Burke. I saw Hendrix a second time. Virtually every weekend, there were multi-band bills at the Fillmore East or Village Theater where I could see three bands for three or four dollars. I found myself bathing in music every weekend. There was a debauched kind of elegance to the British bands. They had great haircuts, they wore velvet and satins, and they were cohesive not only in their musical style but in their attire and personas. They had individual identities but also a band identity. Band members were stylish in a way that complemented one another. They also had a sexuality that American bands of the time didn't have. I saw a lot of those American bands, too, like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, Moby Grape, and Quicksilver Messenger Service. Most of those groups looked like bums who had just rolled out of bed, alone. Seeing some fat guy with pigtails didn't appeal to me. When I saw a band with a bearded guy in it, I thought, what's Sigmund Freud doing in a rock band? I think the initial reason for the light shows they used on stage was to focus attention on the pulsating oils and colors on the screen, instead of on a bunch of slops who looked like they had just finished panhandling. Most American bands looked like a commune gathering. It just didn't work for me. Combine the look with the way they sounded, and it's no wonder people took acid at their shows. I knew, however, acid was not for me. I saw a few people freak out on it at concerts, 
and I saw a kid from my neighborhood committed after he took it. I figured I was a prime candidate for a one-way ticket to the insane asylum. Better to stay in control. I had too many issues eating at me, too much turmoil, and I'd seen what drugs had done to my sister. I had a steadfast belief that losing control like that would lead me down a bad, bad path. The British bands became part of the template for what I wanted to do moving forward, and that template became more and more complete in the coming year or so as I saw Humble Pie, Slade, and Grand Funk Railroad who all created a church-like atmosphere, a religious connection to their audience. A frontman like Humble Pie Steve Marriott was leading a congregation, evangelizing for rock and roll. I believe... Of course, while I felt the music in my blood, I needed money to buy concert tickets and guitar strings and imported English music magazines like Melody Maker, New Music Express, and Sounds, which I bought at specialized newsstands after taking the bus and subway to Greenwich Village. But jobs were hard to find. So when my mother's cousin, who owned a Sinclair gas station off the Palisades Parkway, offered me a job at his station, I took it. The first thing I did was buy a rickety old Rambler from him so I could drive to the job after school. I had to go from Harlem, where music and art was, across the George Washington Bridge, and up to Orangeburg, New York, where the gas station was, work a shift, and then drive all the way home to Queens several times a week. It was hard work, partly because of the distance, but also partly because I knew absolutely nothing about cars. I was the most unmechanical, unhandy person. On one of my first days at work, a car pulled up and the driver said, Check the oil. So I opened up the hood and pulled out the dipstick. I knew how to do that. And I knew how to read it. You're down a quart, I said. Okay, he said. Go ahead and put in a quart. Sure, I said, and I got to work. After a few minutes, the driver asked, Hey, kid, what's taking so long? Well, I had a funnel poised above the dipstick hole and I was trying to drip the oil in there. I didn't know there was another place for adding oil. Despite my initial difficulties, this arrangement worked fine for a while. There was even an attractive female attendant whose regulation jumpsuit unzipped as quickly as mine. Then, one weekend, one of the local newspapers, which cost five cents a copy, ran a Sinclair ad with a one dollar voucher towards gas. Readers could present the voucher for a buck of gas, then the gas station owners would send in the vouchers to get the dollar back from Sinclair. My mom's cousin had me buy as many copies of the paper as I could, transport them to a station in a borrowed station wagon, and cut out the vouchers. He planned to claim the dollar from Sinclair's corporate office without ever pumping the dollar's worth of gas. In exchange, he said he would reimburse me for all the five-cent newspapers I bought and pay me a cut of the money he got from the gas company when he redeemed all the vouchers. I brought in many carloads of papers, and he made thousands of dollars, but he never paid me back for the papers, much less a cut of the money he made. Swindled by my own relative, so I quit. After that, I got a job at an upscale deli called Charles & Company. It specialized in gourmet cold cuts, cheeses, and canned goods and had locations all around New York. I had to wear a wig to hide my hair. It was tight and gave me a headache, but I worked behind the counter preparing sandwiches and putting salads and spreads in containers, so it was necessary. A district manager of the chain came in one day, and after he had conducted his business, he came over to me and said, You know, you could wind up a manager of one of these stores one day. I think this was his idea of a motivational speech, but it had the opposite effect on me. I knew this wasn't where I belonged. God, no. Anything but that. In the fall of 1968, at the start of my junior year of high school, I learned that the post-war baby boom wasn't where I belonged either. At least they didn't think so. John Rail and the other members had gone off to college, most of them to Bard and SUNY New Pulse, upstate but not at the ends of the earth. I had figured we might keep playing during their breaks and that maybe I would go up on weekends and play with them. They had other plans. They didn't tell me I was out of the band. I figured it out when they came home one weekend with another guy, who was a guitar player. They were still playing together up at college, and this new guy hanging around was part of it now. That hurt, especially because they didn't tell me. I took stock of the situation and thought about what to do. I'm going to become a better guitar player. But just as important, I'm going to keep writing songs. No, there was something more to it than that. Make the most of what you have. 
There's no reason to wait for a band. So what if I didn't have a band? I had songs and I was writing more of them. By this point, I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder I used to make recordings of my songs. With me, the music and melody had always come first and I filled in the dots, including the lyrics, from there. Maybe I can get other people to record my songs. Some of the magazines I bought, like Hit Parader and Song Hits, printed song lyrics. And at the bottom of the pages where the lyrics were printed was always information on the publishing company and the songwriter. Well, if I'm a songwriter and need to find an outlet for my songs and don't have a band, I guess I need a publishing deal. I was such a loner that making a career in music on my own somehow made perfect sense. So I spent a good deal of my junior year calling around to publishing companies and talking my way into auditions to showcase material. The one I remember best was at the Brill Building, because the place was already legendary to me. I went in with my guitar, sat in an office opposite someone who had agreed to meet me, and played songs to this stranger. The funny thing was that while I had always been extremely wary about opening myself up by bringing songs to the band, I found it easy to play them for people I didn't know. But even though some of the people were very nice and encouraging, nobody signed me. I still had a lot to learn about my craft. Chapter 8 I found myself hanging around Middle Earth, the head shop, and often I visited the couple who owned the place at home in their nearby apartment. We would shoot the shit and hang out, and I'd play my acoustic guitar. They had a friend in the same building who also played guitar, and some days I'd go to his place and jam. I never called first, I just showed up at their places. I smoked pot sometimes, and it was kind of fun sitting on the floor thinking of ridiculous things, suddenly becoming a genius, and philosophizing about life on other planets or about the bark on trees. It wasn't very productive, and I realized that if I wanted to write songs, I couldn't spend time smoking pot and eating sandwiches. I still had a goal. Socializing with older people, though, became an outlet for me. It kept at bay some of my neurosis about socializing with kids my own age. And it could be on my own terms. It wasn't like I had to see these adults at school every day. Around the same time, I became friends with a woman down the block named Sandy. She was married to a guy named Stephen, had three kids, and was in her mid-twenties. I started hanging out with her and her husband, like the couple at Middle Earth. I spent a lot of time with them. It was great not to have to be at home all the time. One day when I was hanging out with Sandy, she said, I have something to tell you. Okay. Stephen left me. That's terrible, I said, and gave her a big hug. We wound up holding each other on the sofa, and then she led me into the bedroom. Whoa, what's happening here? This is awesome. My sexual technique was non-existent, but I'm sure Sandy appreciated my enthusiasm. I was a human jackhammer or a love gun. At that age, just taking off my pants got me excited. Having someone else there was a bonus. Up until that moment when I slept with Sandy, sex had seemed like something that would be impossible to find. This changed everything. Luckily for me, Stephen didn't have a change of heart about leaving her, so I started to drop by Sandy's house more and more. Her door was only a few steps from my own, and now it was the entrance to a sexual fun park with a thrill ride like nothing I'd ever experienced. These rendezvous could be pretty late because we waited for her kids to go to sleep. One night I called my house from Sandy's and told my mom, I'm going to be late. Again. Honestly, Stan, what's going on, she asked. Mom, she has a lot of problems. My mom knew that the couple had split up and seemed suspicious of our connection, but she didn't really want to know the truth. Once I understood that I had some sort of appeal as a young man to older women, my situation changed dramatically. The only thing my dad had ever said to me about sex was that I'd be on my own if I ever got someone pregnant. Sex, I was taught, was deviant and unclean. But man, did I want it. And once I got it, man, did I like it. And now, getting it this way, I didn't have to deal with any of the intimacy issues I would have to work through to persuade a girl my own age to have sex. I couldn't handle that. No way. I still saw intimacy as invasive. I didn't want anyone inside the psychological fortress I had built around myself. I did not want to be close to anyone. 
But now I realized with older women, I could enjoy the act and then immediately hit the road. Do it and get out. And that suited them just as well as it did me. The floodgates were open. Soon enough, another woman from the neighborhood saw me with my guitar and asked me whether I knew somebody who could give her son guitar lessons. She was a divorcee. Well, gee, I can give him lessons, I said. I spent her 39th birthday in bed with her. I was 17. My instincts and hormones drove me into more and more situations like that. It was like a drug, and what a great drug. I now had access to something magical, without having to let down my guard and deal with a meaningful relationship or any kind of real intimacy. I never had to worry about anyone wanting more from me emotionally. I didn't see any rules. I never considered the ethics of what I was doing. If somebody's wife wanted to sleep with me, hey, that's fine because she wants to do it. The fact that someone else was often involved meant nothing to me. That was their issue, or would be. If a woman made herself available, that was good enough for me. The husband of the couple who owned Middle Earth seemed captivated by a girl who came into the store a lot. Then one night, at a party at the couple's apartment, He started hitting on that girl. I think the couple was moving in the direction of an open relationship anyway, but that night the wife seemed upset about her husband going off with another person. So I wound up in another bedroom with the wife and a German shepherd that seemed as interested in me as she was. Hey, these people are all adults. I didn't want a girlfriend. I didn't want a relationship. That was scary but I could still get what I craved in a completely unattached, unemotional way. In situations that might have seemed intimidating to others, there was, after all, a chance that somebody's husband might want to cut off my balls as my dad had been threatened or even kill me. Seemed ideal to me. I didn't confide in anyone. I continued to exist in my own little world, but sex was now one of the forces that drove me. It didn't matter where or with whom. I remember inviting myself to a party at a neighbor's house one night. I just walked in. They were using one of the bedrooms as the coat room, throwing all the guest coats on the bed. And I ended up taking a woman into that room and screwing on top of all the coats. A few people came looking for their coats as we were going at it, and they were absolutely aghast. But I didn't care. Boundaries as far as what was appropriate simply didn't exist to me. Where I had been alone with my music not long before, now I had sex. Sex! The beast had awakened in me. Another time, a girlfriend of my sister slept over at our house, and I tried to crawl in bed with her. She pushed me out of the bed. The next day, my sister told my mom. I thought it was hilarious. In fact, it was a bonus to me that my parents were put off by my behavior. That just made it all the more appealing. I saw music differently now, too. When I saw Led Zeppelin in Corona Park in Queens in August 1969, in front of fewer than 2,000 people, the sexuality of what they were doing was palpable. The show was in the New York State Pavilion from the 1964 World's Fair, a strange semi-open-air facility with a mosaic tile map of the state on the floor, a multicolored plexiglass roof above, and flying saucer-shaped forms perched on columns nearby. Jimmy Page's sound hit me with the same impact that Beethoven had when I was a little kid. He wasn't just a great guitar player. He was a visionary who composed and pieced together sonics to perfection. Led Zeppelin took a music form that was by then familiar, blues-based rock, and made it into something new and something all their own. Robert Plant sang like a banshee. I didn't know anyone could sing like that. I'd seen Terry Reed and Steve Marriott, who had sort of laid the groundwork for what Plant was doing, but Plant was better, more commanding, more magnetic, more consummate. He created a style that didn't exist before, and for all his qualities as a singer, he was more than just a singer. Robert Plant was the physical embodiment of a rock god. Nobody looked like that. He was an archetype in the making. I remember the next time I saw The Who... Roger Daltrey had grown out his bouffant hairdo into long curls. Aha, he wants to look like Plant, I thought. Everybody wanted to look like Plant and sound like Plant. Everything on that summer stage was stunning. It was the closest thing I ever had to a religious experience. I had gone to the show with David Unn, whom I still saw sometimes, and afterwards I said to him, 
Let's not even talk about that. Let's not talk about the show because anything we say will cheapen it. I'll never, ever see something this perfect again. Music, I knew, still represented my salvation and the ultimate solution to my deep-seated insecurities. I wanted the validation I had felt playing in front of crowds. While the post-war baby boom hadn't made a penny, we had played some gigs at places like the Beehive. I also liked playing the showcases at publishing companies. So I started playing with Matt Rail again, the little brother of John from the post-war baby boom. I had played with Matt a lot a few years before, and now we both cranked up our Fender blackface amps and started experimenting, sometimes joined on drums by Neil Tiemann. Often, we turned all the tone and volume controls on the two amps all the way up and created a trebly wall of noise. We managed to score a few gigs at a hippie venue called The Bank in Brooklyn. The building was the headquarters and home of some sort of commune spread over several floors of an abandoned bank building. One of the floors was covered in hay and kids could get donkey rides there. We played on another floor creating a loud wall of noise, our guitar screaming nastily. Matt didn't even face the audience for most of the performances. It was fun to be playing again, but clearly this wasn't the group I was going to bet my future on. Thoughts of the future began to eat at me as the end of high school loomed. I was coasting through senior year and had to think about my next steps. The pressure I began to feel wasn't about money per se. What bothered me was that other people were laying the groundwork for their future security. They were making plans to go to college and learn trades. I wasn't. Much as I believed in myself, there were no guarantees about making a career in music. Kids in my neighborhood were following their parents into medicine or law. Meanwhile, my hair was below my shoulders and I was an aspiring rock god. The percentages I knew were not in my favor. I spent countless scary nights sitting up thinking, what the hell am I doing? No matter how sure you are of yourself, you're going to have some dark moments of doubt. Your self-belief gets questioned, even if it doesn't disappear. I lay in bed thinking. I had a plan, sort of. It was more of a goal than a plan, really. I had something I knew I was working toward and something I was gambling on. But there were no milestones along the way to check off. It wasn't like working toward becoming an optometrist. What if? What if I don't make it? The fears came at night. Eventually, I plotted out a scenario of last resort. I would work for the phone company. That was a well-paid union job with good benefits. And if I could get a job as a phone installer, and they were advertising for them at the time, I would be able to work on my own, away from people, away from any bosses. I could do that. I would drive around in a van and install phones on my own. Chapter 9 Matt and I began to argue at rehearsals. I thought we were just messing around more than creating something or moving forward. I also felt he should face the audience instead of his amp when we played gigs. Things came to a head one day when Neil and I asked him to turn down his amp while we were practicing. Turn down, we shouted. No, Matt shouted back and kept playing as loud as he could. So Neil and I called it quits. We walked out and the group was done. Matt and I remained friends, even started working together as taxi drivers, but I think it was a relief for him in some ways not to be playing with us anymore. Of course, I wanted to keep playing, and since I'd been turned down when I went solo to the publishing companies, I felt a band was the right way to go again. Neil, who was working part-time at a recording studio by now, heard from a friend of his about a guy named Steve Coronel who played lead guitar. So we called Steve and got together, worked out a few covers, played a few of my originals, and started booking gigs. The band with Matt had never had a bass player, but Steve wanted to bring one in. I know this other guy, Steve said. The guy's name was Gene Klein, and he and Steve had played together as teens in a band called the Long Island Sounds. Gene was living somewhere out of town now, Steve said. He was apparently a few years older than I was and had already graduated from college. I didn't care whether he lived in Sullivan County or Staten Island. If there was a possibility that we'd be moving toward creating a real band, I was all for it. One night I went over to Steve's Manhattan apartment in Washington Heights, not far from where I had lived as a little kid. Steve's room was painted black. 
and in the room was a big, burly guy. Stan said, Steve, this is Gene Klein. Gene had long hair and a beard under his double chin. He was very overweight. I was pretty stocky back then, but this guy was huge. He was wearing overalls and sandals and looked like something from the then-new country music TV show Hee Haw. Gene made it clear right away that he didn't see us as his musical equals. He played some songs for us that I thought were sort of goofy. Then he challenged me to play one of my songs, so I played something called Sunday Driver, which I later retitled Let Me Know. He seemed completely thrown that someone besides John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Gene Klein could write a song. It was a moment of realization for him. He was another guy who wasn't famous who could actually write a song. He was visibly taken aback. He mumbled, hmm. I was annoyed that he saw himself as operating at a level that qualified him to pass judgment on me, as though all that mattered was his approval particularly because I hadn't thought much of his songs. The idea that he was judging me seemed arrogant, condescending, and ludicrous. He made it clear that he felt himself to be judging from a higher plane, and I didn't like that at all. Gene, of course, had no clue about my ear, which was covered up by my hair. But I was pre-programmed to dislike being scrutinized and judged. It wasn't a nice thing to do as far as I was concerned, and I wasn't eager to work with the guy. Another night, Steve, a bass player named Marty Cohn, and I played a free gig at a coffee shop on Broadway and 111th Street called Forlini's Third Phase. The place was lined with styrofoam, and we played with a bunch of amplified gear. We played some originals and some covers, including Mountain's Mississippi Queen, and the crowd got into it. Gene came to that gig, too, because Steve had borrowed some of his gear, and he was clearly impressed. At some point after that, I answered an ad in the Alternative Weekly, The Village Voice, for a guitar player. When I rang the number, I found out that the guy who had placed the ad, Brooke Ostrander, was the keyboard player in a band looking for a lead guitarist, not a rhythm guy like me. That was the end of that. But not long afterward, Gene called me and asked whether I would come to New Jersey and work on a demo tape his group was trying to finish. He wanted me to come for a day or two. I agreed. Strangely, it turned out the group was working at the home of their keyboard player, Brooke Ostrander, and this was the same band Brooke had placed the ad about. Brooke was already a school music teacher. Gene, too, bragged about some white-collar job he had that paid $5 an hour, a fortune at the time. They had a home tape recording machine as opposed to something fancier that might be used in a studio, but we worked all day. Toward the end of the night, Brooke and I smoked some weed using a big fish-shaped bong. I was absolutely out of my head, and with the workday done, we listened to Pink Floyd and Jethro Tull, until it occurred to me that I didn't know where I was sleeping that night. Come on into the bedroom, Brooke said to me. Uh Uh-oh. That was one of the longest walks I'd ever taken. I wasn't sure what to do, but when he opened the door, I saw two beds in the room. Thank you, Lord. Working with Gene like that, I could see that we had some things in common. His family were Holocaust survivors. He was smart and serious. Even though he and Brooke were working in New Jersey, Gene turned out to live only about 15 minutes away from me in Queens. It also turned out that he'd had a band upstate during college, and they had played live quite a lot. He had a lot to offer. He could sing well and play bass well. He could write songs. Perhaps most importantly, Gene was focused. One thing I had figured out by then was that talent, like everything else, was just a starting point. What counted was what you did with it. I knew I wasn't the most talented guitar player or the best singer or the best writer, but I could do all of those things, and I had a complete vision of what it was going to take to succeed. A vision that included working, working, working. Gene wrote a lot of very odd songs. Maybe it was because he was originally from another country. I wasn't sure. He had one called Stanley the Parrot, another called My Uncle is a Raft. He even had one called My Mother is the Most Beautiful Woman in the World. Um, okay, that's a bit weird. Still, the more we played together, the better it got. Gene and I liked the same kind of music, and we could sing harmonies well together. I decided I wanted to work with him. I could see a bigger picture now, and despite his idiosyncrasies as an only child, teamwork was not Gene's strong suit, 
we both were intelligent enough to know how to harness ambition. And after all, it would be a lot easier to slay the dragon with a second person to help. As we continued to rehearse together, Steve Coronel ended up joining us too, and we slowly started to become something more and more like an actual band. Chapter 10 In June 1970, I graduated from the High School of Music and Art, finishing just a few dozen people from the bottom of a very sizable class. I was, in fact, amazed that I had graduated at all, given how little I had shown up to class. Graduating was a mixed blessing. I was glad to have school behind me, but I was scared shitless about being drafted. The Vietnam War was in full swing and the last thing I wanted was to be drafted. I didn't need to go to Vietnam any more than I needed to take acid. During years of building fear, I had managed to accumulate some medical documentation of various problems, like back pain and other things I'd seen a doctor about. One day I went down to Whitehall Street in Lower Manhattan with my draft card for induction. They reviewed my records and quickly dismissed me. All my fears, the years I spent anguishing over being sent to Vietnam, had been for nothing. I told my parents the great news, how I had taken all my medical records to prove I wasn't fit for service. They looked at each other quizzically and said, Didn't you know you can't be drafted? Why? I asked. You're deaf in one ear. Aha! Shocked, I thought of all the times I had brought up the subject of the draft during high school. Every male approaching draft age was concerned with what was to come. I had made my fears clear to my parents on many occasions. That was one fear they could have laid to rest for me if they had ever told me I was ineligible for the draft. Why didn't you ever tell me, I asked. They turned to each other, looked back at me, and shrugged their shoulders. Ten more points for my parents. It was true that I couldn't tell the direction of sound, but I had never put two and two together, and nobody else had ever put two and two together for me. At that time, New York State had decided to make college available to any resident, and I thought that despite my bravado about making a career in music, I had better apply to the city college system. I had already stacked the deck so much against myself, maybe this new opportunity could be the safety net I might still need. Since I hadn't taken any of the preliminary tests and I had terrible grades, I was admitted to Bronx Community College. I got a student loan and promptly used it to buy a second-hand blue Plymouth Fury to replace my broken-down Rambler. When I showed up for the first week of classes, I didn't think many of the people looked like what I considered college material. They probably thought the same about me. Despite the change of scenery, college quickly proved to be a continuation of everything I had hated about school. I still had the same basic problem. I couldn't hear well enough to follow what was going on. And it wasn't as if classes took up an hour a day. I was supposed to be there nearly all day. And then there were the assignments on top of that. When I thought about the time I would have to devote to college, I began to see it as an obstruction. I was willing to put that much time and more into reaching my goal, but this wasn't helping me to do that. In fact, it was detracting mightily from it. It made it impossible. And for what? I was never going to succeed in the classroom. It was just a waste of time, and time, I reasoned, was the most precious thing I had. This is just more of the same. I don't belong here. This is not for me. I thought about the new band, the fact that I was no longer going it on my own. I thought about the ideas I had discussed with Jean, about getting a full-time rehearsal space. Sure, Jean had grown up an only child, his mother telling him he was God's gift to the world, and Jean believing it. Sure, he had his quirks, but then again we had real chemistry, and the two of us together were much stronger than either of us on his own. We had a battle plan. This is not for me. To leave yourself no plan B is a dangerous thing to do, but going to college was taking away from my focus. For a band, focus was success. I needed to live it 24 hours a day, not just nights and weekends. Wasting time at Bronx Community College was sabotaging what I was trying to accomplish. I had my Plymouth now, which meant I had transportation to get to and from rehearsals at all hours. This is not for me. 
After the first week of classes, I never went back. Part 2. Out on the Street for a Living Chapter 11 Jean Klein lived with his mother and her husband in Bayside, Queens. She called me the bum. The three of them lived in a three-story house. A tenant lived on the ground floor, and Jean and his family lived upstairs. One day I was standing in the front yard talking to Jean, who was hanging out the window. His mother leaned out and in her thick Hungarian accent said, Stan, please, this is a quiet neighborhood. In other words, I was from the wrong side of the tracks and didn't understand that things were different here in this nice area of town. In his mother's eyes, Jean could do no wrong. If I happened to call when he was in the bathroom, she would say, The king is on the throne. Even when he was on the toilet, she believed he created masterpieces. I, on the other hand, couldn't get a compliment out of my parents if my life depended on it. They went out of their way not to compliment me. I think they thought they were toughening me up that way. Jean could do no wrong. I could do no right. Of course, when you considered the particulars of my situation, it wasn't so surprising that Jean's mom thought I was a bum. My sister and her boyfriend drove around in a van, apparently selling drugs and also dropped acid daily, sniffed glue, and did whatever else they did. Ultimately, she got pregnant, but by the time she gave birth, she had separated from the guy. I was at the hospital with my parents when my niece Erica was born. My sister was in no shape to raise a child. She was still struggling with mental illness and still heavily self-medicating. One weekend, my father and I rented a van, drove to Boston, where she lived in some sort of commune, loaded all the baby things into it, and carted it all back to my parents' apartment. The baby was already living with my parents anyway. From that point on, interaction with Julia almost completely stopped. There was still fear and uncertainty about whether she would try to take Erica back or start a custody battle with my parents. Once, Julia came to the house to visit and was clearly not well. She was holding Erica and suddenly I heard the front door bang open and saw Julia running down the street with the baby. We had to run after her and grab Erica back. It was terrifying. As part of my parents' philosophy of not acknowledging problems, my niece grew up calling my mom, her grandmother, Mom. And because my dad wasn't comfortable choosing what to be called, he became by default Honey which was what my mom called him. Whereas Jean was a college grad earning good money as an assistant teacher or a clerk, he held several jobs during the first few years I knew him, I had bounced from gas station to deli and dropped out of college. Now I was getting ready to take the exam to become a part-time New York City taxi driver. While other kids in our neighborhoods were studying to get credentials for long-term careers, I had left myself no alternative but to succeed in music. I had no choice but to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, plotting how I was going to accomplish that. For me, it was all about work. You can gauge how important something is to you by how hard you are willing to work to get it. Fortunately for me, despite his mother's opinion of me, Gene seemed to agree that he and I were better together than on our own. I think our partnership meant more to me at the time, though. With a modicum of approval and somebody to hang out with, I eventually stopped going uptown to see my psychiatrist, Dr. Hilson. Gene, on the other hand, seemed to have more going on in his life than I did, whether it was girlfriends or jobs or whatever. On the surface, he also seemed more content than I was, more happy-go-lucky. From my perspective, I saw Gene as important to the plan, and the plan was all I had in my life. I had realized after being rejected by publishing companies that I needed a band as a vehicle to get my material out there. On my own, I was at least three people short of the team I needed. In Gene, I felt I had found another key member of the team. By that stage, I had met or seen a lot of people who wanted to be musicians and said they were going to be stars, but most of them didn't have the discipline and weren't willing to commit to doing the work. Talent was all well and good. The people who won, however, were the people who worked the hardest. Gene had a work ethic like mine. Once I landed a job driving for a taxi company called Metro, based near Queens Plaza, I had money when I needed it, but still had near total flexibility. I drove a big Dodge sedan with a flimsy partition between me and the back seat. 
The business was at a turning point at the time with fewer and fewer classic cabbies. The old guys with cigars were being displaced by people like me, actors and musicians, people who needed a source of income and a certain amount of freedom. I quickly figured out what the company looked for as a minimum take for a shift so I could work to the minimum if I felt like it. Basically, how hard I worked determined how much I made. I also figured out where the wires were that lit up the bulb in the rooftop for hire sign. I learned how to twist it apart without looking under the dashboard. That meant I could take a fare off the meter without risking being caught by a taxi inspector who might see passengers in a cab with the for hire sign still lit up. A giveaway that you didn't have the meter on. Gene and I rented a rehearsal space on Hester Street in Chinatown, just above Canal Street in Lower Manhattan. The building was what we called Tenderwood. If you lit a match, the whole thing would have gone up. But it was great because we could leave our gear there instead of lugging it around all the time. The full band, me, Gene, Steve Coronel, Brooke Ostrander, and drummer Tony Zarella rehearsed there three times a week, but Gene and I were there a lot more than that. Although I hadn't been initially too impressed with Gene's songs, as we gelled, we started to write very effectively together. It was exciting to have a collaborator, someone creative and intelligent to volley ideas with, a writing partner. I didn't feel alone anymore. Gene was also a terrific bass player. He could play intricate, interesting runs and sing at the same time, something most people couldn't do. And his ability to come up with melodic parts to complement chords was a huge plus. Still, although I valued the partnership, I didn't necessarily value the way he dealt with things. He showed up late to rehearsal a lot of the time and never apologized. It wasn't unusual for me to wait more than an hour beyond our scheduled meeting time at a subway to go together to the rehearsal space. He was very much about himself. It could be maddening, but I paid him back sometimes. We often ate at a cheap Chinese restaurant on Canal Street where you could get a scoop of whatever dish you selected from the menu over rice or noodles for $1.25. One afternoon, Gene and I ordered plates of food and cans of Coke. The place was empty. When Gene went to the bathroom, I grabbed the squeeze bottle of hot mustard and squirted a big dollop into his Coke. When he returned, he put the straw to his lips and took a big swig. I just waited. All of a sudden, his eyes bugged out of his head and started watering, and he screamed, Oh, my God! He was three years older than I was, and I played pranks on him like a pesky little brother. Our funds were limited to a few dollars each back then, at most. One day we wanted to get some food while we were practicing but didn't have any money between us. So we took our guitars and went out onto Hester Street in front of the loft and played Beatles songs. The bucket filled up quickly and we had our meal ticket. We made so much money that day we figured we'd try again, but the next day, almost as soon as we started to play, the cops chased us off. That was the end of our busking career and our dream of unlimited mushu chicken. I realized early on that Gene had been taught to value and appreciate money. Sometimes it worked out nicely. I often gave him my old shoes, for instance. Other times I stirred up shit. I threw pennies into the street in Chinatown because I knew he would run out and retrieve them. I used to just stand on the curb and fling them, and he would run into the gutter to get the coins. Whatever the disparities in our lives, Gene and I found common ground. We shared some touchstones. We both came from Jewish immigrant families. We both lived in Queens. But I think it had mostly to do with our style of work. He and I both gave 100%. The other guys in the band didn't seem driven in the same way. Tony, the drummer, was in the band for one reason only. He was a dead ringer for Geezer Butler of Black Sabbath. He wasn't much of a drummer, but he had a huge set of Ludwig drums and looked the part. He viewed himself as some sort of intellectual. He once came to rehearsal with a drawing that he thought would be perfect as a record cover if we made an album. The image showed the earth and a flower in outer space crying. He looked at me and said, You get it? No, I said. Yeah, you get it. I have no idea what that is. A flower crying on the earth? Okay. Because Brooke Ostrander played flute as well as keyboards, the band worked out a cover of Locomotive Breath, a brand new song by Jethro Tull. But Brooke sometimes had a problem when he sang. Saliva would go down the wrong pipe and he would double over coughing. 
He might be singing one second and then suddenly drop out. I turn around and see him choking. Lead guitarist Steve Carnell and I didn't always get along. After one argument, he started yelling at me. Do you think you're special or something? He shouted. Yeah, actually, I do, I said. I have an aura. From the look on Steve's face, you would have thought I had just shot his mother. You think you have an aura? Steve was incensed. Then Gene spoke up. He's right, Steve, Gene said. He does. Chapter 12 We played a gig in early 1971, billing ourselves as Rainbow. A community college in Staten Island hosted the gig, and I got crabs for the first time. You can get crabs from a bed. You can get them directly from a person. But I didn't get them from a bed or a person, which might have helped make it at least a little worthwhile. Instead, I got them from a toilet seat at that community college. Soon after the gig, I started itching, but it took a while before I put two and two together. I finally realized I had crabs when I found what looked like breadcrumbs in my underpants. Upon closer inspection, the crumbs were crawly things. There must have been a hundred of them. It was revolting to think they had been living on me, feeding off my body. It was the middle of the night when I figured out what they were, and I woke up my parents and told them I was going to the emergency room. I wasn't going to wait an instant longer to get treated, and it wasn't like there were 24-hour pharmacies back then. My mom was horrified that I might spread them through the house. Honestly, Stan, she said, what kind of dogs are you sleeping with? Once I had overcome my revulsion to the critters, I found it all very funny. And the fact that my parents were disgusted and revolted by my lifestyle was a source of pleasure to me. I might never get the approval and support from them that I so desperately sought, but hey, at least I was getting a rise out of them. In April 1971, the band played another show up in the Catskills, about two hours north of New York City, this time with a new name, Wicked Lester. We played fewer covers and more of the songs Gene and I had written. Back home in Queens, one day I popped into Middle Earth to say hello. The owner pulled a piece of paper out of the register and handed it to me. A guy from Electric Lady was here and we got him to leave his number, he said. Electric Lady meant Electric Lady Studios, the facility built by Jimi Hendrix on 8th Street in Manhattan. To a musician, it was like Israel to the Jews. It was hallowed ground. I examined the note which had the name Ron and a phone number scrawled on it. I couldn't believe they'd gotten this number for me. I dialed it and said, Can I speak to Ron, please? Which Ron? Shimon Ron or Ron Johnson? Well, Ron Johnson sounded more promising somehow. Ron Johnson. Please hold. Ron Johnson was a producer at the studio. I was connected to his secretary and left a message with her about my band, his leaving his number at Middle Earth, the whole spiel. I called back the next day, same story. Ron wasn't available. I called back over and over again, day after day, until I finally told his secretary, you tell him that it's because of people like him that bands like mine break up. That got him to the phone, and he agreed to come to our rehearsal space to listen to the band. Only later did I learn that the person who had left his number at Middle Earth was actually the other Ron, Shimon Ron, who was head of maintenance at Electric Lady. When Ron showed up, he liked what he heard. You guys could be as big as Three Dog Night, he said. There might have been a tiny morsel of truth to the comparison. We played a hodgepodge of styles. So sure, one song might sound like Three Dog Night, but the next sounded completely different. To be honest, Wicked Lester had no real style, no real focus. Even so, Ron Johnson said he would record us and then shop the tapes to get us a contract with a label. He presented us with something called a producer's agreement. Things were suddenly happening fast. I took the contract to Matt Rail's dad. He was a businessman, and I trusted the family. This is a completely one-sided contract, Matt's dad told me. Not in your favor. We signed it anyway. This was a chance to get a record contract, to record at Electric Lady, to put out an album. We were not going to mess it up. Once we signed the production deal with Ron Johnson and started to record our songs, he began to line up auditions for record labels. One was with a newly formed label called Metro Media. Afterwards, Ron came up to us and said, They passed. We broke into huge grins and gave big thumbs up. Yes, we passed. No, said Ron dryly. They passed. 
Finally, Epic Records told us they would sign Wicked Lester on one condition. We had to get rid of Steve Coronel. It was the first instance when we had to decide whether this was about friendship or about success. We decided to let Steve go. It fell to Gene to tell him. The label replaced Steve with a session guy named Ron Lejack, and then Epic signed us to a record contract. We were going to put out an album for a major label. We even got a modest advance. I bought my parents a washer-dryer with my share of it. I was still living at home, after all. Ron arranged for us to record cheaply, taking advantage of unbooked time at Electric Lady. If a band session ended at noon and another band wasn't coming in until later in the afternoon, we went in and worked on our record. Often we waited around late at night hoping a band might pack it in by one or two in the morning, giving us time to record. It was always a bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes we sat around for an entire day before getting a chance to work for a few hours. The first time I ever saw cocaine was during those sessions. An extremely well-known band was recording in Studio A one night when we were in Studio B. I managed to talk my way in to hang out while they worked. At some point, one of them said, I need some fresh air. The guy pulled out an Excedrin bottle, poured some powder out of it, and snorted it. Later, the same guy came into our studio to listen to a playback of something we had just put vocals on. Since his band was known for its stellar vocal harmonies, I was hoping for some advice on our track. The harmonies on our song were questionable and clearly needed work. He still had his Excedrin bottle with him. He listened to the song and said, Man, that sounds good. He came down a few pegs in my mind that night because I knew it wasn't good. Maybe it was the blow talking. I don't know. Then one of his bandmates came in and asked whether any of us could set him up with a girl. I couldn't believe it. These were major stars. One was asking random people at a studio to find him a date, and the other had a vial of coke and couldn't tell that a tune was crap. This was the life of a rock star? Once we started recording, albeit sporadically, we didn't need to rehearse at our own space as often. But one afternoon, we all dropped by the Chinatown loft. Where's the mic stand, I said. Where are the amps? Where are the drums? Holy shit, everything's gone. We knew people sometimes got into the building. We'd even had a huge, wild-eyed mental patient in a green hospital gown and no shoes barge in on a rehearsal one night after escaping from a local facility. But we didn't expect someone to jimmy open the metal cover over the window leading to the fire escape. A plate steel cover and padlock protected that window. Or so we thought. The air went out of the room. I don't know what went through the heads of the other guys, but all I could think was, okay, how do we get past this? Was this a setback? Sure, but I never lost sight of the bigger picture. We don't really need that stuff anyway. We're in Electric Lady Studios making a record. We're lucky. We could borrow guitars if we needed to. We could use cardboard boxes as drums. We didn't need to rehearse at the moment anyway. We were at the studio all the time using equipment that lived there. I definitely needed more money, though, to replace all that gear. Gina and I also wanted to buy our own PA to be able to play live shows on our own terms. So I started working more taxi shifts. One of my favorite fairs had always been dropping people off at Madison Square Garden, the legendary arena in midtown Manhattan. As things were going downhill for Wicked Lester, Elvis played four shows there in June 1972. I picked up a group of people one of those nights. Where to, I asked. Madison Square Garden, they said. I smiled. And I'll never forget pulling up to the curb in front of the garden that night. Because in the midst of all the turmoil, one clear thought rang out in my head as those folks got out to go see the king in all his sequined splendor. I will be here someday, and people will be taking taxis to come see me. Chapter 13 By the end of the summer of 1972, we completed the Wicked Lester record. We had recorded some of our own songs, but also a lot of songs Ron brought in from publishing companies. Some of the songs had wah-wah pedal, others had horns. We had done what we were told, basically, and the result was awful. Gene and I both hated the album. We sat down together, just the two of us, and decided we didn't want to release it. In fact, we didn't want to play with this band anymore. 
It wasn't working as we had hoped, so we decided to scrap the record and part ways with the other guys. That proved more easily said than done. Tony the drummer said he wanted to uphold his end of the record contract, so Gene and I quit the band. At that point, we had no band, no label, and virtually no gear. But what had made us start working together in the first place shined through at that moment as we both had the same response to the setbacks. No band, no label, no gear, no problem. First off, Gene and I needed a new rehearsal space. We didn't plan on replacing our gear and leaving it to be stolen again. We found a place at 10 East 23rd Street called Jams. We initially rented space on an upper floor by the hour. We didn't have any gear to store there anyway. There was no immediate drawback to taking our acoustic guitars in and out with us. Soon, though, a space a few floors below became available to rent by the month. We took it. Our new space again had plate steel over the windows. It was a big empty room and we lined the walls only with discarded egg cartons, thinking that would help soundproof it. Gene put a mattress in the space so he could sleep over on occasion, and we had a couple of rickety chairs. The overall effect was a bit claustrophobic, though that was also in part because we spent so much time there. Gene and I talked about the direction we wanted to go, and it became clear very quickly that we both wanted to create a new beast, something cohesive both visually and sonically. In a lot of ways, what we wanted to do was the antithesis of Wicked Lester. That band was all over the place musically, and we wanted to narrow things down. As for the look, Wicked Lester could have been just a bunch of random guys who happened to be waiting in line at the same bus stop. We knew we needed something like a mission statement in order to create the right kind of cohesiveness. I played him the concept at SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things and records by The Move and Slade. My first thought was to have two drummers, two bass players, and two guitar players. To make a sort of rock orchestra along the lines of what Roy Wood of The Move was trying to do after leaving the Electric Light Orchestra and forming Wizard to create a big wall of sound. I wanted to keep things tight, too. Much as I liked Led Zeppelin, I knew we would never be a jam band. We didn't have the ability to stretch out a song for 15 minutes. You need an extensive musical, musical vocabulary to do that, and we just didn't have it. It would have been pointless and boring for us to try to stretch out at that point. Much of the time, Gene and, Gene and I facing each other on the old wooden chairs, acoustic guitars in our laps. Among the first things we worked on were A Hundred Thousand Years, Deuce, and Strutter. The chords of Strutter were from Gene's old song, Stanley the Parrot. Although the original song was a bit offbeat, I always loved the chords in it. We started try, trying to, re to, re to recast it in the vein of the Rolling Stones, and the words just came to me. She wears her satins like a lady. She gets her way gelled. You take her home and she says, maybe, baby. She takes you down and drives you wild. The whole glitter scene was a, was a style and the girls looked fantastic. Of course, I wasn't doing so well socially. I spent all my time rehearsing or driving a taxi, not hanging out in clubs. God knows I didn't have a girlfriend in fishnet stockings or satins, but I saw hip women walking around the village and I saw other bands with their girlfriends. For me, it was singing about an ideal. I was celebrating something I wasn't really part of. Well, what the hell, Brian Wilson had never been on a surfboard either. My songs tended to be very much chord-based, mainly because my ability to play riffs was fairly limited. So Gene would often supplement some of my songs with riffs. He had a better understanding of how to play notes and runs. On Black Diamond, for instance, he added a back riff that plays against the chords. The lyrics to Black Diamond were another example of creating a romanticized vignette about the life of the city. I mean, I knew about as much about streetwalkers as I did about Lilliputians. Gene and I fed off each other and filled in blanks for each other, lyrical and musical, as we worked. I remember the words to A Hundred Thousand Years hitting me on 23rd Street. Sorry to have taken so long, must have been a bitch while I was gone. On Deuce, the guitar figure that starts the song and then reintroduces it after the solo is mine. Even if both of our names didn't appear on any given song, our fingerprints were all over each other's songs. Gene and I also sparked each other with song titles. I had started a song called Christine 16, but Gene was the one who ran with the title and came up with a really good song. Black Diamond started out as a title of his, and I ran with it. There was no animosity or resentment, just the sense that we were working toward a shared goal. 
Each of us had a few older songs in complete form that we needed only to slightly retweak to make them fit in the new repertoire. She was a leftover of Jean's. Firehouse and Let Me Know were leftovers of mine. Together, we consciously tailored the songs to fit our concept of the band instead of just cranking out whatever struck our fancies on any given day. I was excited. We were doing things that neither of us had been capable of doing on our own up to that point. And we now had built the foundation for success, a rock and roll manifesto in the form of a catalog of strong, cohesive songs. Alongside our musical development, we molded ourselves into what we thought we should be. For the first time, I knew I was working with someone whose vision was as big as mine. I'd been around kids who could play their instruments before, but Gene seemed to understand the whole package. The fact that your music or your musical ability was just one part of making yourself an appealing musician. Like me, he saw the importance of marketing yourself, not in a Madison Avenue way, but in terms of appealing to people, being engaging, promoting yourself. Success wouldn't happen by chance, it would happen by design. Toward that end, we made a conscious decision to lose weight. Gene had already changed his name once from Chaim Witz to Gene Klein, so one more change from Klein to Simmons was no big deal for him. I had always hated my name and even told my parents as a little kid that I was going to change it. They said I could change it when I got older. Little did they know I was going to do it almost as soon as I was legally able. The chances of a rock star named Stanley Eisen seemed pretty slim. It just didn't sound like Roger Daltrey or Elvis Presley. Stars were supposed to be larger than life. Why was there no Archibald Leach? Because Cary Grant sounded better. Ringo Starr sounded better than Richard Starkey. It wasn't about hiding my ethnicity. I would just rather have been Paul McCartney than Shlomo Ginsberg. But I, but I want a stupid name like Rock Fury. I wanted a name like the people I aspire to be like, something easily identifiable. The question was, what sort of name? Ozzy Osbourne's nickname derived from his last name. Izzy Eisen? Nah. Then it hit me. Paul. That was a comfortable name. There was Paul McCartney, of course, and Paul Rogers of Free, another band I liked. I didn't want to completely give up who I had been, so when I thought about last names, I was happy that my thoughts went Daltrey, Presley, Stanley, Paul Stanley. Initially, I didn't change my name legally because I figured I'd go back to my original name at some point after our career took its course. In those days, bands ran their courses pretty quickly, and nobody then had made it to ten years, though a few, like The Who and The Stones, were closing in on it. I hoped for five years.